Well, thank you very much for the warm welcome. Uh, so I am Mark Michelson. I work at Digium. Um, my title is technical lead these days, but really I'm just a glorified software developer. And Josh already introduced himself, but he's also going to be involved in this talk. Um, what's going to happen here is uh, we're going to start off, I'm going to talk about uh, Asterisk 12 and why there's a new SIP stack in it, as well as some of the process that went, in, went into uh, creating it and all of that. And then Josh will come in and he's going to give a demonstration and an overview of the features that the new channel uh, driver provides. So in order to understand where we came from on this, it's good to understand what the goals of Asterisk 12 actually were. Now these top two bullet points are really the big driving factors behind Asterisk 12. So for instance, we wanted to make Asterisk be a better platform for people to be able to develop applications. And if you've been listening to a lot of talks today, you've probably heard ARI mentioned. And ARI is the big new fancy thing that allows for application developers to use Asterisk. Um, we also wanted those same people to be able to get consistent state from Asterisk. So for instance, um, AMI events now in Asterisk 12 look a whole lot better. And um, you no longer see weird things like channels being renamed. You don't see zombie channels. You don't see masquerades happen anymore in Asterisk 12 uh, due to some big refactoring that got done on the inside. One of the things that was decided on last year at the Asterisk Developers Convention was that the SIP support in Asterisk needed to be, um, how can I say this? It needed to be made better than how it was before. Um, it just really didn't seem like it was the, the current implementation was the right choice in order to allow for future expansions to occur rapidly. So we looked into what it was that we had SIP-wise, SIP and we looked at what we needed to be able to do. And most of what we needed to be able to do was architecturally related. You know? So based on what we knew we needed to do, we had to decide, OK, do we just refactor Chan SIP and keep Chan SIP the way it is? Or do we need to rewrite a new channel driver from scratch? And pretty much every time that we looked into the risks involved with refactoring Chan SIP, we actually said, it's actually a much smarter idea to just rewrite a brand new channel driver. So once we decided that, we had to decide, well, how do we pursue that? So we can use one of the many very nice third-party SIP stacks out there. Or of course, we could try our, <laughs> the same folly again and write our own SIP stack. And we very quickly decided that using a third-party stack was a much, much, much better idea. So then came the debate of which stack do we get to use, actually. And in our discussions, there were three that came up as prime candidates. Uh, the first was uh, Reciprocate, which is a C++ SIP stack. There was also Sophia SIP, which is actually the SIP stack that was originally no developed by Nokia, I believe, but is basically maintained these days by the FreeSwitch developers. Um, and the third one was PJSIP. And in the end, we chose PJSIP as our SIP stack of choice. So there were several factors that went into why we chose it. First of all, the fact that it's written in C makes it a lot easier to integrate into Asterisk than anything that's written in a different language. Second, um, PJSIP actually has a page on their website that just lists applications that use PJSIP, and there are a ton of them. So PJSIP is being used, it's being tested, in a sense, out in the wild, and it's, people are very happy with it. Um, third of all, it is actively maintained by uh, a group called Telu right now, and they are, you know, they will accept changes, they make new versions. It's not that we're trying to use a dead project. And uh, one thing that certainly factored into it was that Josh and I actually had already written essentially a SIP uh, channel driver that used PJSIP before because we uh, worked on the Asterisk SCF project and Asterisk SCF used PJSIP. Um, and of course, you know, you can't look over the fact that PJSIP just offers a good set of features. So we presented the idea of using PJSIP to the Asterisk community and most people were pretty fine with it, but the people who had the most trepidation were people involved with packaging Asterisk. 
So one of the things they told us was they hated the fact that in asterisk 11, we had embedded PJ project into the source because it pretty much made it unpackageable for them. So what they said is, if you're going to be using PJSIP in a larger capacity than you had it in asterisk 11, do not embed PJ project. Use a separate library instead. And they also said, don't be forking PJ project so that you put your own custom changes. Instead, anything you do, just contribute upstream so that everyone benefits from all the changes. And third of all, they said that a problem with PJ project at the moment is that it's not packageable. It's not packaged by Debian. It's not packaged by uh, Red Hat or any of those. So they wanted us to work together with uh, PJ Project's maintainers in order to get the project packageable. And I'd like to mention that we did all these things. So once we decided on using PJ SIP, it was all about architecting a new SIP channel driver. So the, probably the important number one thing that we came up with was that the architecture had to be highly modular. Um, so in other words, instead of having one file, that is Chan SIP, that is 30,000 lines of code, instead we have a bunch of modules that each do one specific thing as opposed to trying to put everything all in one place. Um, we also tried to be as forward thinking as possible because one problem with uh, Chan SIP right now is that there are things that are hard coded in there that people wish they could override but that they can't. So anytime we came across some sort of decision point where we said, well, some people might like to do this one way, other people might like to do it another way, we said, all right, well, we're going to make it extensible there. So to give an example of that, um, in Chan SIP, you don't have a whole lot of control over when, say, a SIP invite comes in, how it detects which user or peer or friend or whatever that it's from. You pretty much can match based on IP and you, or you can match based on username. Well, we said, okay, what if we just made it so that's extensible, so people could potentially write their own module and say, I want to match based off of some random SIP header in the request, or based on the time of day, or whatever they want. And the idea is they could insert a module in, and it would do that. Um, we also created a new configuration architecture, because one of the problems that we encountered with Chan SIP was that people would report an issue, we would try to reproduce it, and it wouldn't happen. And then we find out, oh, they were using dynamic real time, and that changed everything. So we had inconsistency. So with the new configuration architecture, you have consistent behavior no matter what the configuration scheme you use is. So if you're using a flat file configuration, or whether you're using a backend database, or whatever it may be, it's going to behave the same no matter what. And uh, the other thing about uh, the new SIP channel driver is that we changed up the configuration scheme dramatically. So configuration is based more on actual SIP concepts as opposed to asterisk made concepts. So for instance, explaining to someone what the difference is between a SIP user and a SIP peer in previous versions of asterisk can be very difficult. And it's unlikely that you're going to get the explanation 100% correct. But in the new one, you have the idea of just endpoints. And it's very clear to say that an endpoint is just something you are communicating with. And you also break out other types of uh, configuration items as well, which Josh will probably go into a little bit more when he's doing his uh, turn up here. And just to sort of drive home the point of the modular design, this is a very good picture of what we're looking at here. Um, I'm going to steal a quote from Matt Jordan on this. He, uh, he said that Chan SIP is a channel driver that happens to have a SIP impl implementation inside it, whereas uh, Res PJ SIP is a SIP stack that happens to have a SIP channel driver as part of it. And that's a really good way of putting it. In fact, you could have SIP support in asterisk and just completely remove that Chan PJ SIP block at the top, and you could have a SIP registrar or a SIP uh, pub sub type server if you wanted. Or you could remove or modify any of the other blocks in it and have yourself a working SIP server that just does what you need it to do. And now Josh is going to demonstrate a few uh, 
concepts from SIP and give you a few a feature overview. Uh, yeah. So it's sort of hard to demonstrate exactly what's changed because in reality we've tried to target our features towards just common everyday things that people do. Um, before I get into that, I have a slight question. Has anybody actually played with the new PJSIP uh, work that we've done? Wow. I did a talk, I think. Yeah, not bad. Um, yeah, there's some cool stuff that if anybody is actually interested in playing with it, that will help you uh, when you go down that road. Uh, but first, you have a question. It's, I don't believe that mic is actually on at the moment. It's down at the bottom of it. There's a switch. Give it a second, and then you may be able to speak. Ho, ho. Yeah. I'm just uh, saying about one gap that I was looking for in SRS before. This is the ability to listen on different interfaces simultaneously. OK, I'll get to that, I'll get to that yeah. soon. Um, so yeah, let's just start out with a simple playback. I've got uh, Cham PJ SIP running on my laptop in a virtual machine, since virtual machines are all the rage. Uh, and I'm just using Blink here. Congratulations. You have successfully installed and an just like you'd expect, the call comes in, PDF. executes the dial plan, and do a core show channel, and configuration show you stuff. That help you to get um, like so what actually happened there is that the different modules that I've loaded in my running asterisk, uh, they built a stack essentially, and they determined who it's coming from, which is my Blink endpoint. And then some other modules built upon it, like Cham PJSIP itself, uh, started executing the actual, uh, the actual dial plan. And I've got one that actually does an outbound call, and as I am slightly bra brave, this is actually going out over the Wi-Fi. Um, so just like in SIP, you can dial uh, endpoints, or you can dial explicit SIP URIs uh, like you normally would. Currently, there is a fundamental difference when dialing outbound in that you must always specify an endpoint which uh, covers the configuration of the outgoing leg. So uh, before in Chan SIP, you'd actually have the global section with general and all that, uh, which would cover that. But to simplify things internally, we change that around. So yeah, features, calls. We can do the normal stuff you would expect, video and audio. But we've architected things in such a way that if 10 years down the road, uh, if there's some sort of other thing added, like, I don't know, we'll do screen sharing, because that's a thing right now, too or uh, smell. We can easily extend that without touching the core. Uh, so previous, previously in Chan SIP, to actually make those changes was very, very invasive. Uh, but now it's easy. We can also do blind and intended transfers, like you'd expect, and caller ID and CULP. CULP does not refer to me. It refers to connected line updates. And DTMF, uh, info, in-band, and RFC 4733. How many people are still using fax? OK, not as bad as I was expecting, so that's, that's OK. Uh, we didn't originally think we'd get fax into Asterisk 12 quite yet, uh, but um, we were able to get T38 pass through gatewaying, sending and receiving just like you'd use with uh, Chan SIP in the new uh, PJ SIP work. Uh, but the difference is, instead of embedding this in one place, like in Chan SIP, where there's T38 code all spread throughout it, handling the different uh, SDP negotiation and UDP TL setup and all that. It exists as a completely separate module. So if you don't need T38 facts, you can uh, completely unload that and not expose yourself to provincial issues, or rather, potential issues that may occur as a result. Registrations. This is Outbound registrations for SIP is pretty much the same as Chan SIP itself. Uh, it's just configured differently. We have an explicit section for each outgoing registration. And as you'd expect, it also does authentication. But one of the cool, nice new things that we have for inbound registrations is multiple devices per address of record. Now, if you're not familiar with what an address of record is, I will slightly infuriate myself and go back into Chan SIP land and say, when you register to a peer, 
what happens? Go ahead. You can answer me. It's OK. Or I'll answer on your behalf if you're shy. OK. What happens if you register something else at the, like five seconds later? That doesn't happen anymore in the new PJ SIP code. There's specific configuration that allows you to control that. So you can specify how many maximum contacts you want to allow on the AOR. And you can also bring it back to the SIP behavior where if something new registers, the old one is just completely thrown away. So uh, if you have, like I do, an actual mobile phone, a desk phone, a soft phone, a WebRTC phone, I'm looking at you, Tim. Uh, you can all register those to the same basic account. So I would, I personally just use J. Cole. <laughs> yes, uh, there is some caveats with that. Internally within Asterisk, we can't expose the different um, logical devices that are part of that record. So if you're doing something like device state, it is an aggregate result. So if you have three devices uh, registered, two are unavailable, one is available, overall you are available. Further down the road as Asterisk uh, develops and we can tweak that internally, I expect that um, the information would not be dumbed down anymore and it would be exposed and you'd have finer grain control. So transports. So currently, can you the I can repeat the question, I suppose. The question is, when you dial that, what essentially happens? Do all three ring? And the answer is, within the asterisk core, when you dial something, it does not currently expect you, uh, expect to be able to return multiple outgoing legs, essentially. But uh, there is a dial plan function you can use for this situation, which creates a dial string that will dial all of the devices. So you pass it in the AOR name, like I use Jacob, and it will give you back the correct dial string, and all of them will ring. So transports, um, this is quite a bit different than Chansip. In Chansip, we've got all of the options uh, lumped together in the general section, and you can't have multiple transports. We actually can in the PJ SIP code. So we do IPv4 and IPv6, UDP, TCP, TLS, and WebSockets. And you can have multiple configured simultaneously. Uh, if you do and you're multi-homed or something, um, issues come up if you're trying to, the code isn't smart. It doesn't know what you may want to send your outgoing call out on. Uh, it may choose the wrong one. So for those situations, you may have to explicitly configure an outgoing transport. And unlike chance SIP, settings are configured on a per transport basis. So take for example NAT. There's not a single NAT option that covers every transport configured. It's on a per transport basis. And that covers all of the transport related, uh, related options. Events. So if I didn't put commonly known as hints and dial plan up here, how many of you would have known what I meant by that? Just out of sheer curiosity. Okay, so a few. Um, they're what the regular people like us know as hints. So that's monitoring the state of an extension. Uh, we do MWI, unsolicited and solicited. But unlike Chan SIP, due to the way that things are architected now, uh, you can actually, so for example, if you're doing a transfer, in the RFC there's an implicit uh, subscription to know about that transfer of how it's going, the status of it. Uh, we can now actually accurately provide that information back to a phone. So some phones will actually, if you do a transfer, they'll keep the button active and show you how it's going. For example, if the, if the person you've transferred ends up calling someone else and they're ringing, on your phone it'll show ringing. Uh, Chansip sort of fakes that and just always sends you back, hey, it's ring, even though that may not be accurate. So that's a, a, that's a difference between the PJ SIP code and Chansip itself. So the past, Chan SIP, as much as many of us would like to eradicate it from this earth, it's not going away. We don't have feature parity right now. Um, my optimism makes me think one day we will, but the future is uncertain. So bug fixes will continue to occur. If security issues come up, we'll fix them. And from the community, new well-tested features will still be accepted. But 
the Digium software development team, we're focusing on the PJSIP stuff because it's a solid foundation for stuff. Now, ChanSIP and ChanPJSIP can coexist on the same machine. They don't overlap, so the dial string is PJSIP instead of slash. And as long as you bind them to separate ports, they'll work fine together. For those who may want to experiment and try out the new PJSIP code, uh, Kevin and Mark have uh, teamed up, sort of, and written a conversion script for SIP.conf, meaning it will take in a SIP.conf file and it will spit out a PJSIP.conf file. So it can really get you up and running really quickly with your existing configuration. There are some tweaks and improvements that have been done that are currently up for review, uh, but once those are in, it's a viable option if you just want to experiment. Uh, but if you actually want to like figure stuff out and not have to rely on that, you can of course write your own pjsip.conf file. And I'll show you an example here soon. So the future, chan pjsip. Just like chan sip, bug fixes will occur. I expect those will happen pretty rapidly. Uh, and it's targeted for new feature development. So we're trying to bring this to feature parity and, and beyond chan sip because we have that solid foundation. And unlike past times, new features will be allowed midstream in asterisk 12 for the SIP work if it's a separate module and it's well tested. So as long as we have tests that verify that nothing's, uh, nothing is broken, that the functionality works, we will add it in. So the actual feature set of the PJSIP work in asterisk 12 is going to evolve as asterisk 12 does. So any questions right now? Run. Thank you. So how does uh, hint slash message weight indicator relate to multiple contacts in AORs? Because you said that states in AORs are aggregated. Yes. Um, so for MWI, mm -hmm. uh, if you are... So are we, call, are we talking solicited or unsolicited? Uh, or would you like yeah, me to do? solicited, subscribed, yeah. So, subscribe, nothing changes. Uh, that, um, that actual subscription is used to go back to the original device, so it doesn't do a, a location lookup and uh, go that way. Uh, for unsolicited, it will send the MWI information back to all of the devices that are uh, registered to that AOR. Okay, aggregated. Well, it, it's... You're asking if MWI, like the mailbox message numbers are aggregated? Yeah. Okay, oh. for, for unsolicited MWI, um, they will be aggregated. Um, and the reason why is because when you have unsolicited MWI, you haven't had a subscription come in to tell you what specific mailbox that you are trying to subscribe to. And if you send back multiple unsolicited notifies with different mailboxes and different accounts, I mean, it may be possible that there are some phones that know how to handle that sort of thing, but I've not come across it. So, but with solicited MWI, presumably if you have different subscriptions coming in for different mailboxes, you will get separate uh, mailbox counts coming back to you in those notifies. Uh, and I'll just say on that, if there is a specific specification for relaying that information, like if you're, one example I could think of is if you are uh, connecting to PBX systems and you want to uh, bring MWI information from one to another, um, I've unfortunately had to do this, then it's easy to add in another module to actually implement that specification. So um, further, down the further down the road, we could add that functionality if, it, uh, if we needed to pretty easily. Thank you. Okay. I think he had his hand up first, so I'm head over there. There you are. Are there any issues with licensing or with um, oh, the fact is PJSIP open source, or how does that work? PJSIP is dual licensed, so if you need a commercial license, you can go to them, but it's also available under GPL v2. Uh, so it is license compatible with asterisk. Okay. Uh, Tim? So can you talk about the performance comparisons? Are they, is it, like, it going to be much happier with huge numbers of registrations and things like that? The performance right now is different. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So speaking from a PJSIP perspective, uh, I've done some rough initial performance testing, and this is with, without really tweaking the stuff that much. I'm just using the module we've written right now. And calls per second uh, seem to be about a 10 to 15% increase um, per um, CPU usage. And then registrations right now are a point where there it, the registrar itself is using more, a bit more CPU than uh, Chan SIP. But I have some ideas of how we can improve that. Um, so I, 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 from my initial testing, things seem to be better than Chan SIP. When we go further down the road and do actual formal testing, then we'll see. I was thinking about the threading. So the threading level is much more PJSIP correct. Is that the one? It is. Yes. We use it a is. thread pool. <laughs> uh, Someone over uh, here had their hand up. I just want to get the mic over there. OK. Maybe this was covered briefly, but is there an equivalent to funk dev state for PJSIP? Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, is there an equivalent of funk dev state for PJSIP? Uh, funk dev state is a generic core functionality, so it should work with PJSIP. Even with uh, do you mean, um, uh, well, that, ORs, that's what I'm yeah, that's what he was saying that right now, because of the way the device state core works, if you have multiple contacts bound to a single AOR, then right now the device state of those three or multiple. Well, what it'll do is it'll, uh, we have a de device state aggregation function in Asterisk that just sort of takes multiple device states and tries to combine that into one, and that one is what you'll see. So like Josh was saying earlier, if you had, for instance, uh, say three uh, contacts bound to a specific AOR, and then you wanted to get the device state, and two of those devices were busy, but one was available, you would just see one device state that just said available. But if all three were busy, then you would just see busy, that sort of thing. But as Josh also said, um, you know, he has confidence that you know, the core could eventually be told that just because I'm looking for the device, of, device state of one thing, that doesn't mean it has, doesn't have, say, sub-devices that have multiple states associated with them. Is that cut off? Yeah, a bit. Of course it is. Oh, no problem. Does anybody else need the microphone? That's a bit better. OK, um, we have a bit of time, so I'll talk about the configuration some. My laptop right now, the virtual machine, actually has two, uh, two interfaces configured on it. Uh, one is for internet, one's for local connectivity between my laptop and the actual um, virtual machine. So I've got two UDP transports configured. I've got one uh, for the Blink soft phone to connect to my asterisk, and I've got one that, actual, that actually is for the uh, internet connection. So I've got two UDP transports configured. Um, they're happy. This is my Blink endpoint, which defines the configuration for my soft phone. Uh, this does not include any information uh, directly about how to reach that soft phone or authentication. Uh, it just covers a bit of configuration. So some normal stuff, uh, wideband, go wideband, uh, symmetric RTP. But if you note here, auth and AORs, Auth uh, points to an authentication section, so it's actually configured separately down here. I'm using username of blink and password of blink. Thankfully, this is not on the network, so you cannot hack me, probably. And then I've got an AORs, which is a pointer to the address of record for my blink, um, which is where my registration is stored. And Due to some fundamental uh, changes that we've done in how we store data, despite me having these in a configuration file, these can be in real time or something else further down the road. And the granularity is such that I could store only my AORs in a database, or I can store my endpoints only in a database, or everything. Uh, and like I was talking about previously, I've configured a maximum contacts on this of 10. So I could register 10 devices to it. Uh, if another one did um, and it wasn't a refresh, then it would uh, be rejected. But you can control that behavior if you want. Is there any questions about that? I'll actually mention one thing before I get to your question. Uh, because I do have two UDP transports configured, the code isn't psychic. It isn't psychic. It doesn't know 
how that maps to reality. So if I didn't specify a transport here, it would have sent it out my local interface, which would not have been able to, well, reach the internet. So as I was talking about earlier, if you have these multiple interfaces and you want to control it, you're probably going to have to specify it. Or write yourself a module to do that and plug it in, and then it would also work. This is great. Now, I see it's covered. Uh, in another question, uh, is, is there any possibility to store, or probably it's not, to store the location information in the DB to uh, build clusters? It's good for building clusters. Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so the, when you write with this new API called Sorcery, you can specify a default way to store stuff. And so the default for um, the location information is uh, AskDB but you can change it to real time or something else or whatever you want. It's, uh, it's like uh, real time was in chance SIP, but taken to a new level. Any other questions? Uh, if you do have any further questions down the road, you get some ideas, don't hesitate to grab Mark and I at any time and uh, we'll be happy to discuss stuff with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>